thanks for coming out after a one hour break. Uh, I expected, well, you know, some people to be napping or shooting down the water slides or something uh, when I saw this. But um, we're going to spend a little time today talking about several different things. And I'll just, he already went through this. I didn't think he knew all that stuff, but I am a chief officer in the Philadelphia Fire Department, the regional director for Philadelphia Regional EMS. And uh, I've got one more year as the president of National EMS Management Association. Uh, how many of you guys are, are frontline supervisors? A couple. How many are mid-level uh, captain or chief officer? Any f uh, chief ex executives or chief of department? Yeah, so we're going to talk about stuff from all of those perspectives. <clears throat> so professionalism is what we're going to talk about primarily. And that's something that's really not part of our curriculum for EMTs or for paramedics. We're going to talk about values. Uh, values are the things or the concepts that underlie decision making and strategic planning. And what a leader's roles and responsibilities are. Each one of you is a leader. Whether it's just you and your uh, partner in, in the ambulance, or a crew, or a station, or an entire department, or if it's only just yourself that you're leading, it's very important that you follow some of the leadership concepts if you want to be successful in your career. And we're going to talk about some of that. So the question comes, who are the people we recognize in our society as professionals? Doctors, nurses. Doctors. Nurses is an interesting question. I got into a fight with some nurses about this. Um, are they a recognized allied health profession? Do they have post graduate degrees, and what are the other things that are defining a profession? You could argue both sides. So who else? We've got physicians, uh, lawyers, right? Uh, architects, engineers, and the, the question really comes, who, who are the others? Nurses, some people will argue. Um, are we? Right, right. So I want to point out an interesting problem. There is professional behavior and there's recognition as an allied health profession. And they're two different things. You have to have one to get to the other. And some of the things that we're faced with and that medicine has been faced with is that they, they've lost a lot of their professional behavior with the kind of corporatization of medicine. And when we get to this uh, article by a guy named Herbert Swick, he was addressing the issues in medicine and it applied, when I read his article, it applied to us uh, significantly. So this is a definition from, uh, I don't know, online dictionary. What is a professionalism as opposed to professional? It's a status or methods or character or standards. We have many of these things already defined through protocols, through law, through statute rules and regulations. Uh, it's, it's tough to know if we really have the status of professionals. Uh, Steve Barry makes a career of the fact that often we don't. Now this is a little bit more. Conduct, aims, or qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. So if we're not a recognized allied health profession, can we still behave as a professional person? Yes, that's the right answer. Yes, we can and yes, we should. We actually have a moral and ethical obligation to do so. And we'll get into some of that. This one's a little bit bigger, but we want to break this down into pieces. Meticulous adherence to undeviating courtesy, honesty, and responsibility. That's pretty hard, isn't it? What does meticulous mean? That you concentrate on. Detailed. Yes, detailed, finely detailed. That you take a lot of time and you pay close attention to. Adherence. <laughs> wow, bless you. Uh, do you need a napkin for those hands? <laughs> My tie, I really, I'll take it off, you can have it. 
because that's what ties were originally for. Adherence means to, to stick to those and undeviating courtesy and honesty and responsibility in one's dealings. Do we do that? Do we do that every day? We try. That's a goal. Absolutely a goal. Sometimes we're put under such stress, such duress, sometimes such disrespect, that it's hard to maintain these kinds of behaviors. Now let me ask you a quick question. Is there anywhere in your department's rules, regulations, job description, performance evaluation that talks about these things? Because if they don't, how do you know how to behave? If you're being evaluated, what are the criteria against which you're being evaluated? They should be in your job description. And they should include these kinds of things. Dealings with customers and associates. It's not just our patients, but it's our partners. And the nurses that we deal with. And the docs we deal with. And patients, family, and so on. A level of excellence that goes over and above commercial considerations and legal requirements. I'm not even sure everybody knows what the con commercial considerations are, because I'm not really sure I do in EMS. And the legal requirements are spelled out in our statute, Act uh, 39, Title, Title 28, and the rules and regulations that go along with it. How many of you guys have actually read that? A few. You really need to know what the law says, because if you don't and you violate it, you're still going to get jammed up. It's really boring reading, but it's really important for all of us to know because that's where the standards of behavior and expectations. If any of you were here for Marty Ranowski's talk, he talked about what the public expects of us. They expect a lot of us, and not the least of which is to obey the laws. So this guy Herbert Swick, uh, 15 years ago, recognized in medicine that medicine was being businessified. It wasn't about like the old days where a guy would come to your house to check you out, or he knew you, your father, and your grandfather, and your kids, and he knew everything about all of you. Uh, it became a business. And how long do you see your, your primary physician when you go for a checkup? Five minutes, ten minutes. Does he know you or she? I, I don't know. That's part of the problem. We deal with people. And you can't really get a lot of personal interaction in five minutes. So he defined the characteristics of medical professionalism. And if we believe that we're medical professionals, these characteristics, in my opinion, are things that we should demonstrate in our behaviors. So, subordinating your own interest to the interest of others. What does that actually mean? Putting the patient ahead of yourself. Putting the patient ahead of yourself. Subordinate below in order. So, do we do this all the time? What happens when it's the 10th? Well, I don't know if you guys experience this very often. But in Philly, I could be on my 10th call in my 8th hour, and I still haven't had a chance to get something to eat yet. When does it balance change that I'm going to start looking out for myself? And this is a difficult choice. The balance should never change. You should never really stop looking out for the patient first. We actually have a legal obligation, a duty to act, that says if you're called, you go. You chose this, right? Nobody forced you to become it. Well, maybe somebody did. I don't know. But you chose to be an EMT or a paramedic. You chose a job that's based on service. And this is sometimes very hard to do. But you have to do it anyway. Adhere to highest moral and ethical standards. Do we have an EMS, a set of articulated ethics? Doctors, they have a foundation, do no harm, no low, uh, I forget, do no harm, always do good. 
I forget Latin. I studied it for eight years, and I remember nothing. So that'll tell you, maybe you guys should all leave, because I don't remember much from my education. But really, it's critically important for us to understand, for us to teach our students, and for us to understand ourselves what ethical and moral actually is. So what does ethical mean? Somebody. Doing what's right. Doing what's right. It's about right and wrong. wrong. And what's moral? Similar. It's about what's right and wrong and a set of behavioral standards within a culture or a community. Right? Do we teach EMTs and paramedics even what the word ethical means or what morality is? Uh, Marty showed a, uh, a clip. He didn't show the clip. He showed a, a screen, screen, whatever you call it, capture of somebody who was doing like, I don't know, they called it booty dancing that got on to, uh, you know, <laughs> is, is, that, is that behaving in a moral and ethical way? In a what? Unethical. And it actually sparked the whole conversation about, you know, a mistreatment of women and disregard for women. So if we don't teach people what moral and ethical is, how can we expect them to behave that way? I think in a lot of ways we're setting our own people up for problems by not doing it, which is why I've been teaching this for a long time, because I believe it's very, very important. And you guys have to become like the ambassadors of professionalism moving out of here. Don't just take it in notes, but put it to play in your own career and with your colleagues, didn't it say, for your associates, and with the people that you teach. We do this all the time, but this is an interesting part here. Social needs and behaviors and action reflect a social contract. What is that contract? People expect a certain level, and we should be giving it to them. They expect a certain level, and we should give it. You were saying? You're always in the public eye. Always being observed, right? How often do you see this now? Never. You know? Uh, I actually was watching some of the stuff from the Pope. Nobody was looking at the Pope. Everybody was looking at their phone. How weird is that? Um, the other social contract is when the public calls, we go. We serve their needs. That's the contract. We serve their needs. And we have to demonstrate core humanistic values. Now, we're going to come back to what core humanistic values are. But what does core humanistic values mean to you? What do those three words mean? What's the core? Core is the scope. Is the, is the scope what you're supposed to start by? Or okay, that's part of it, the scope. What's the apple core? The center, right? And humanistic is about human, about people. And values are things that we think are important. So central, important values to all people. But how does this work with the way that they're dumbing down the EMT courses and the paramedic courses? It's hugely problematic uh, because we don't talk about values. And if you don't talk about values, I did a lot in education talking about affective domain, which are the, the, the competencies that are required within education that are about values and about behaviors related to values and attitudes. Very difficult to assess. Bless you. I can argue that there are better ways of doing than, than what we're doing, but if you look at the national education standards, there are two that address the things we're talking about out of the 193 or 227 or whatever they are. Only two reflect leadership and values. And in the old national standard curriculum, the only place that it talked about values and professional behavior was in an appendix, Appendix F. So do we account for ourselves? What's accountability really mean? And for our colleagues. So first, being held accountable means being held responsible, being able to explain why you did what you did. So why did you push that lady down the stairs? Which is a real event that occurred. Um, he couldn't explain it. Of course, the individual was fired. 
But that's what happened. And then how do we hold our colleagues accountable? So your partner uh, goes to check meds for a patient that's uh, end stage cancer. And you hear his pocket rattling on the way back from the hospital. Turns out he stole the oxys from out of the medicine cabinet. What do you do? How do you hold them accountable? What's that? Well, I mean, for real, turn them in. Why, you know, I want to know, what the hell? Why'd you do that? First of all, you set me up to go down with you. We're going to crash and burn and blow up. So do you turn them in? Is that the right thing? Morally and ethically it is. Should, do you want to be the passenger while this guy who just stole oxys maybe took a few before he got out and he's driving today? Right, but when you think of it as on a personal level, do you want to be the one that turns your partner in never to work again? Good question, right? So these are dilemmas that need to be worked out and discussed in advance. We need to understand and have a plan. Now, as a supervisor, there's one way to go. Did you do it, yes or no? And then what are we going to do to correct it? So the first time with drugs and alcohol, you're going to send them to rehab. You're going to get them help. Why are you doing it and how do we help you? Do we do that? Uh, not enough. I mean, think about it. You guys read like uh, gems.com or ems1.com. How often do we see somebody kill themselves? And maybe somebody else too before they killed themselves. How often do we see that? Are we holding ourselves accountable to take care of our own? Oh, it's a hard question. There's a recent article in gems, a, a class from uh, the ambulance service manager class did a survey. They got something like 6,500 responses to a survey about suicidal ideation and things like that, that uh, the National EMS Management Association facilitated through our LinkedIn group. And the, read the article, as my recollection is the incidence of suicidal ideation amongst paramedics and EMTs was like three times the rate in the normal population. How do we ho hold ourselves accountable for not taking care of our friends and our partners. So I kind of went afield on that. But this is not easy to do, hold people accountable. Uh, demonstrate a co continued commitment to excellence, uh, excellent practice, excellence in education, excellence in patient care. Do we even pay attention as an organization how that goes? Is your quality improvement program really a get you in trouble for not doing what you were supposed to do program or is it working to actually improve your system? Hard to do to do the system improvement part. Easy to say, Tommy, you, uh, you didn't document appropriately so you're suspended for eight hours. Or don't do it again. And a lot of times we'll say don't do it again. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. And then that leads to a whole other problem called normalization of deviance. Because he keeps doing it, nothing happens, now it's okay. Now it's facilitated bad behavior. We'll talk a little bit about that at, later after we get done with this, if we have time. <clears throat> a commitment to scholarship and advancing our field. Do we do that? How many guys have degrees? Guys and gals. So that's a pretty, that's, that changes over the years. More and more people are raising their hands. Um, how many of you guys have participated in research? Well, that's, that's a good number, too. We need to have everybody raise their hand. We need to get it to the point where our practitioners are actually doing the research, not, uh, not nurses and docs, but paramedics. Actually, we need advanced degrees in paramedicine. That'll get us to uh, being a recognized allied health profession. Because for that to happen, you have to have your own body of knowledge supported by research. We hear a lot of talk about evidence-based practice, but that's all clinical, isn't it? It should also be related to the other aspects of our job, the leadership roles and the management roles. So uh, the soft science is a little bit harder 
We only have one publication that's peer reviewed really for clinical stuff, pre-hospital emergency care. Um, do you all read it? If not, why not? It's all we got. That's the, the science that we have that supports our practice. <clears throat> do we do this? Deal with high levels of complexity and uncertainty? Every day, right? Dispatch, what's probably one of the most common dispatches you're gonna get? Unknown, sick unknown, bleeder, right? Um, I got a job for a bleeder, and it was because there was a machete fight. That was a bleeder, all right. I got one for a bleeder because he jumped out the second floor window. Got the hell stop on. Mm, there you go, another bleeder. So, do we have uncertainty? We have it on every job, uh, and we are put in a position where we have to make decisions under uncertainty. I get into a whole discussion about recognition prime decision making and how we don't teach our people to do it, which is what we're put in every day. We train our people in a school setting and then we pwing, get to ride for a little while and now you're in the front seat. Are you ready? What does registry say you are when you get their, their patch? What? No, that's not what they say. They say you are entry level competent. To me, that means not really ready to work and I still have to learn how to be what I'm going to be when I grow up. And I wanted to be a paramedic. Well, no, I didn't. I wanted to be a, something else, but couldn't do that. So now I'm a paramedic instead. But did we set them up for failure? Mm -hmm. Because we don't tell guys how to deal with this uncertainty? Protocol or an, is an algorithm. If this, then that. But what happens if it doesn't fit into the protocol? or it fits into two protocols at once. You seen the commercial? That's what happens. Purple smoke comes out of the top of your head when it blows off. I don't know which one. Is it CHF? Is it COPD? No, it's both. Now what do you do? We have to teach people how to deal with that. This is a critical component of what would be called uh, thinking. Thinking, reflecting on actions and decisions. Critical thinking is made up mostly of this, self-analysis. How often do you actually go back and think about not only your cases, right, your medical cases, how did this go? Do you do an M&M &M review in your head or with your partner? You do after actions on a hazmat or a mass casualty or a big planned event, but do you do it for yourself on each case? Because when you're making decisions under uncertainty, you make your decision based on past experience. And if you haven't articulated in your mind those past experiences, it's kind of random what you get. So this is how you improve. It's what the quality improvement process is for a system. It's a system reflection. But a professional reflects on their own practice and is, does honest self-assessment. Now, did anybody ever tell you that in paramedic school? Nobody told me that. I got told this by a professor in college who set me on a particular path. And I was very, very lucky to have had that experience. We have to teach our people how to do this. It's like CQI for yourself. So we're gonna shift gears here and talk about values. What are values? They provide you the foundation for your decision making, right? So if you haven't reflected on your personal values and what you think's important, how can you make good decisions? Why did you become an EMT or a paramedic? Was that a good decision? How did it fit into your value system? Have you reflected and articulated what's important in your life to say, I can continue to make good decisions? And I can, I'll admit wholeheartedly, I've made a lot of bad decisions. And looking back, I've tried not to make that same mistake again. And sometimes you slip and you do it two or three or four times, right? Until finally you just realize, I better not do that 
ever again. If you don't have good foundation, your building, your structure is going to collapse. Do you want to be in charge of your own career development, of your own movement through EMS, or even through your life? It supports strategic planning. So from an organizational perspective, the organization's values should support the way you plan moving into the future. From a personal perspective, you have to have a strategic plan in order to be in control of where you're going in your career. And it's based on your values. So they, they can be personal, they can be organizational, right? So in the Philadelphia Fire Department, we have on banners in the Fire Academy the 16 uh, institutional organizational values that were articulated by one of the deputy chiefs who was the director of the Fire Academy. Uh, he used to do a lecture called Values. And it wasn't really a lecture. He'd kick all the other officers out, and it was an open conversation with a deputy chief about what do you think is important. And he's the guy, uh, Gary Appleby's his name. He's published this, this story of his values in like Fire Chief Magazine some years ago. But these are the things that the fire department has said are important. Love, pride, courage, loyalty, integrity, commitment, discipline, <clears throat> and responsibility. And you can't see it very well, I don't think, but that's the motto of the Philadelphia Fire Department, dedication and service. And then on the other side, they have the other eight, duty, honor, family, honesty, mission, tradition, uh, compassion, and uh, camaraderie. Now, there's a real interesting situation that can occur. These have been posted on banners. And every time you go to the fire academy, you see them. But does everybody behave in ways that are consistent with these values? Now, is that a problem? Think about this. Do you assess what your new hires or your new students have as a value set as, com as compared to what your organization's values are? Have you articulated your organizational values? Think about this. Now, we have s these 16 values posted up. What if we hire people whose values are completely different than this? You think that's a recipe for, for, disaster. for disaster? Yeah. It's, you can call it values discord or values conflict. These have been up there for a long time. And there aren't a whole lot of people that talk about these values but it's something that needs to be reviewed over and over and over and over again. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the core humanistic values that we mentioned before. Honesty. People expect you to be honest. Truthful. In a lot of ways. Right? Truthful in your patient care reports. Truthful in your oral presentations. Truthful in your turnover at ch shift change. You know, uh, I just realized it, but I left the stretcher at Methodist, and I worked at 65th and Woodland, if you know. That's a pretty good distance. And I go out to the back of the truck to get my bunker gear, and it's like, no stretcher. Oh, and I said many things that I won't say right now. And the guys coming in that had to go back to Methodist to get it, they had a lot of nice things to say, too. Although on the way back, they did stop, get coffee, and donuts. But people expect us to be honest. Integrity. What, what does that mean? Integrity. Doing the right thing. Somebody said, most of the time the people respond with doing the right thing when nobody's even watching. And that, that's the core of integrity. But it also has to do with performance in compliance with standards. Right? We have a lot of standards. We have protocols. We have the law. You have your rules, regulations, policies, and procedures of your organization. You need to behave in ways that are compliant and demonstrate commitment to these various values to have integrity in practice. Caring? How often have you seen uh, an uncaring paramedic? Who? Oh, wait a minute, who's lying over there? Never? I was one. I got to tell you, 
I got to the point when, you know, you get back to the station, you just took your boots off, you lay down in the bunk, and you're just getting to the edge of sleep and the bells and the lights go off again, and you're like, fuck. You know, another bullshit run was what would come to mind. And uh, I wasn't very caring in those days. I was getting a little crispy around the edges, uh, a little toasty. And I, I had a, a, a mentor who said, Touchstone, you've got to get your head out of your ass. You know, you've got to stop that. It, it's not a bullshit call. Somebody called, we've got to go. We've got to take care of them. And if you're miserable, stop. Or quit. Because I don't want to work with you if you're going to be like that. Because you're dragging me down. And I realized, you know, that's pretty true. And I kind of turned myself around. Uh, compassion, caring, emotional connection to people. Do we do this? You know, do you reach, well, what do they call it? Like, uh, it's like compassion burnout. You have a certain amount in your glass. When the glass is empty, do you just stop caring and stop being compassionate? Well, that's a problem, isn't it? And really, we choose this. We chose this course. Uh, and if, if you can't do these things, maybe you made a wrong choice. It's not a value judgment per se, but if you can't meet these values in general, it's a problem. Uh, altruism, what does this mean? What's altruistic? given for others and before yourself. And compassion had to do with an emotional connection, as does this, uh, uh, recognizing people's suffering and wanting to do something about it, to help, right? <clears throat> Which is close to empathy. Is any, I, this, I'm too old. My, my references sometimes don't work anymore. But anybody actually remembers Star Trek, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and there was one episode called The Empath. And in this episode, the empath, this woman, when somebody was injured, she would, is it all right if I touch you? Oh, she would lay hands on, right? And whatever the injury was would become her injury and he would be healed. And then she'd use her magic energy or science fiction energy because it was Star Trek and heal herself. And then she'd have to go like eat a lot and rest. Empathy is understanding others' emotional responses to the circumstances they're in from an experiential perspective. Very hard to do. Like uh, Bill Cosby, I don't like to use this reference because of what Bill Cosby's been through, but I thought it was really important. How can a man really have empathy for a woman going through childbirth? And Bill Cosby's explanation, well, imagine taking your lower lip and pulling it over your head. So that's what it's like. So... Do we have empathy, or do we lose that caring uh, over time? Respect. How often do we make judgments and then disrespect people because we don't agree with their life choices? All the time. Constantly, right? The stew bum. And see, I have a name. A stew bum. Or uh, a gomer. Or whatever name you guys, I know you guys have them. Names, labels, judgments about people and we change the way we treat them based on that judgment, right? That's not very good demonstration of respect. Uh, it's problematic. How do we change that? We teach them better. People trust us. We go into their houses without a warrant. We learn their most intimate secrets. They trust us to not violate HIPAA and share those secrets. They trust us not to take their money or their drugs or their jewelry, right? But it happens. I've been accused of stealing stuff. Uh, $250,000 worth of diamond and platinum jewelry I was accused of stealing off a woman who had a dissecting aortic aneurysm and she was a bilateral amputee. And back in those days, what you did for an aneurysm was what? Long time ago, MAST. Mast, right? How do you put mast on somebody with no legs? That was our dilemma. The dilemma changed from being this woman who essentially died to what happened to the diamond brooch, the platinum wristwatch, and the ring that was on her finger. And they said, oh yeah, the medics took them. Well, lucky for me, they found them in the trash when they cut off her clothes. The 
clothing got put in a belongings bag and then somebody picked up the belongings bag and put it in the trash. And they recovered it. But how did we get to be like the culprit there, mm -hmm. the paramedics? What's that? We get blamed, yeah, we catch blame. You know, we're low people on the totem pole. It's partly our own fault because some, sometimes people actually did that. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna shift gears. Those are the, the core humanistic values that support our decision making. And what does this have to do with leadership? So now we're gonna move. Each one, remember I said each one of us is a leader, right? We have to be a leader. Even if it's only you in a responder, you're gonna take control and do something in the scene, right? You're gonna lead your way out of the conundrum that you're faced with. So it can be personal. Do you have, uh, organizations have mission and vision statements, right? And if, you're, if you have a good organization, you actually participated in writing it. Do you have one for yourself? Do you have a vision for your personal future, what you want to accomplish, and how you're going to get there? That's personal leadership. That's that reflecting back, taking the time to invest in yourself. Now, like, I had a bunch. I knocked them out. I'm moving on. And, like, one of the things I want to get done is I want to restore my Austin Healey that's been sitting in a garage for about 18 years. How am I going to get 20 grand to do that? And I've got a plan now. Or, you know, I want to get promoted. I want to finish my degree. Those kinds of things. Crew leadership. Are, are you, are you uh, the lead, the attendant on your ambulance? You have to lead your partner. Uh, if you're a shift supervisor, you've got to lead all the people. And then if you're a middle manager, not only do you have to lead the supervisors, but you're responsible for how well the supervisors are leading the members. And then at the executive, you've got the whole ball of wax. So you guys know John Maxwell. He's like writes a gazillion books on, on leadership. And this quote I thought was interesting because it goes to some of the things we already talked about. Successful leaders are learners, and the learning process is ongoing, a result of self-discipline, which some of us have problems with. I know I have problems with self-discipline. Uh, if I get into something, I kind of sometimes go too far. Uh, and perseverance. You have to keep at it. You have to keep at it. Don't give up. So you might set yourself some five-year goals. And if it takes you seven years to get them done, you're still getting closer to making your, your future real. So what, what are the leadership characteristics? That was interesting. Gadunk. Something's, something's happening. That's not me. Next door. Stop it! It's yourself, right? Looking to the future. What's the future state we want our organization or our lives to be in? So perhaps that is, for me right now, looking to the future, I really want to get my Austin Healey back on the road. It's been sitting in a garage for a long time. Or I want to finish my master's degree. Or I want to publish a book, right? Various targets in the future. These are things for all of us to consider in our own professional development. And then you have to articulate that vision. So what does that mean, articulate your vision for the future? Is it let people know about it? That's risky, too, because if you tell somebody you're going to do something and you don't, ooh, but it's absolutely, it puts pressure. It also means externalize it. I was, huh? Prioritize too, yeah. Um, I was listening to NPR and they were talking about don't, let's not lose handwriting, right? Let's keep handwriting. This is not a very cognitive function. Handwriting is a much more complex cognitive function. People who take notes by hand remember better. Do you journal? as a reflective activity. Remember we talked about reflection. Articulate your vision in writing. And go back and look at it. And set goals for yourself. Create a future for yourself. And then your mission statement 
just like it is for an organization, becomes how do you make your vision real? So the vision is what describes your future state. For somebody, it may be buy a house, pass National Registry paramedic, you know, get your degree, uh, learn how to cook, all kinds of different things. And, and what that does in a leadership perspective is it helps to motivate your followers. Because a participative leader pulls all of you guys in together to figure out what is our collective vision for the organization. And then all together we work towards making that vision real. Based on those choices that we make, based on the core values that we have, based on all of us moving forward together. Uh, that's what leaders do. You can't be a leader if there's no followers. Sometime take a look on uh, YouTube and look for a video called First Follower. Very interesting little video. Some guy's at a concert and he's dancing and acting all goofy and he's all by himself and then suddenly somebody else comes and starts dancing with him. And next thing you know, it reaches a certain point where there's a hundred people dancing. Take a look at it. It's a little out of context from what really happened, but it's a good narr a narrative. The vision is what sets the pieces of your strategic plan. Strategic planning is high-level planning. Tactical planning is how to handle an incident. Strategic planning is how to win the war. It works for personal planning, high-level planning for yourself, and high-level planning for your organization. Any of your leadership positions that you're in, you need to have a strategic plan. It's, I'll talk, I think, what time are we done, five? Um, I'll get into a little bit about a different way of going about strategic planning. Uh, because the problems we're dealing with are very complex. And as a leader, you have to understand complexity. So uh, there's another quote here. It's from uh, Kindle and Loeb, a leadership, uh, from a leadership book. It says, leadership sets the style and the tone for achieving a vision and motivates people, this is interesting, motivates people to sacrifice for the attainment of the vision. To sacrifice for the attainment of the vision. We sacrifice all the time, right? We go to work when nobody else is working. We go to work when everybody else is on holiday. But what other kinds of sacrifices do we have to make? And we've talked about some of them earlier. Think about that. Are the people that work for and with you willing to sacrifice to help you make your organization better? Uh, so the leaders articulate the values. We, as leaders, have to communicate expectations. How do we expect you to behave? How do you demonstrate through your actions that you are uh, buy into and you have commitment to the values of the organization? Um, and inspire achievement. We have to, uh, Marty talked about it, we don't recognize our own people enough. We don't give them the recognition a leader should give recognition and inspire people to do more, to be better. Give them the support and the resources they need to achieve and ultimately to achieve the vision. Now, if it's in your own life, if it's your personal vision, you still have to inspire your own achievement. Seems a little weird, doesn't it? Inspire yourself, but, but you can do that. It might come from your church. It might come from a mentor. It may be the people that are around you that you take in their ideas and you're inspired to do your own work. Uh, leaders have an obligation also to evaluate performance and then report back. So if I don't tell you what you're doing well and what you're doing wrong, how can you change your behaviors to do less of what's wrong and more of what's right? Do you find in your organization that some people continue to do the wrong stuff over and over again, like we talked about earlier, and how do you correct that? Uh, you support improvement through resources. There's a, a whole thing you can do as a leader, as a manager, as a mentor. Uh, it's called professional development planning. It's a collaborative activity that we figure out where you want to go and how can I help you get to where you want to go. And that will ultimately make your entire organization stronger and better. And I mentioned that term mentor. What is a mentor? Somebody that will there to guide you in the proper way to achieve. So a person who will guide you. 
Where do you find one? Somebody with experience? How else? How do you get a mentor? In the movies, what do they do? They drop out of the sky because you were like the princess that was captured at birth and taken away to some other place. Or, you know, you're the kid that really, you're the Harry Potter, right? No, it doesn't happen like that. If you want to get a mentor, you have to go find one and ask them to be your mentor. They may say no, because mentoring is hard work. But you've got to seek that person out. Somebody that you admire, somebody that you'd like to do what they did, that's willing to share. Uh, as a mentor, you, you won't find people to mentee very easily. If you offer it, some will take you up and some won't. If you want a mentor, you've got to go find him or her. Uh, but as a leader, you also have a responsibility, in my opinion, to mentor the folks that are willing to listen to be a role model. Because that's one of the things leaders have to do. You know, don't do as I do, do as I say. is not a good role model. Uh, the guy who comes, responds to uh, the tones drunk, who's the chief, not a good role model. Uh, have you thought about how you're being a role model for those around you? Peers can be very strong leaders and very strong role models. Actually, they can be stronger and more influential sometimes than the, uh, the organizational people, the chiefs and the officers. You have a real smart, real experienced person who just doesn't want to take on those responsibilities can be a very powerful uh, a leader within the organization. Uh, that could be you. And you really have to embody those personal and organizational values in your behaviors. Because if you're, again, asking somebody to be trustworthy and you're stealing, it's a problem, isn't it? And I just saw one the other day. I mean, you watch those ems1.com newsletters and stuff. Somebody, uh, somebody just stole like $1.2 million from their school system and, and only apologized after she got caught. <laughs> uh, you see it where the guys are taking money from the foundations that are supporting ambulance companies. And basically, we have an, a responsibility to demonstrate through our actions that we're professionals. And that goes across the boards. That brings us all the way back to the beginning. Who, how are we going to earn respect by behaving in ways that are worthy of that respect, right? So uh, that really wraps this piece of it up about being professional, behaving like a professional, and professionalism as a way of acting. Getting recognized as an allied health profession, whole different conversation, right? But it starts with us behaving and earning the respect of our peers and the, our colleagues and our associates. So do you guys have any questions relative to this conversation? That's the responsibility of those of us that teach. Because you can put a values message into every scenario. For instance, uh, what, what's, what's one of the values? Uh, if you go to Bloom's taxonomy of, of educational objectives and you look at what they're talking about in the effective domain, one of the competencies that we need is somebody who's willing to volunteer. Right? So how do you measure that and how do you put that into a scenario? Well, you set up a situation where they don't have something that they need and somebody has to volunteer to go get it. Right? Very simple, little things like that. If you think when you develop your scenarios, your educational scenarios, they can have clinical components, which can be cognitive, knowledge, they can be psychomotor skill, but they can also be affective about attitudes. So you get to the scene, and it's an elderly woman, and you find that the one son who's there says, you need to take my mom to the hospital right now. You just need to get her out of here. And you're starting to do your assessment, 
and the other son comes in and says, no, 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 she's a DNR. Don't touch her, leave her here. Now what do you do? Right? This is a problem in the scenario when you, when you do it in school. It's, it's not about the clinical care of the woman, which you can't deny. We never should lose sight of the patient, right? But there's this whole other problem. How do you deal with this conflict between the brothers? How? Do we teach that? We need to teach that. We need to give them strategies. We need to give them tactics to de-escalate this, con this uh, conflict. So what are the, what's the rule? What's the protocol say? Do they have a valid and active DNR? Is she wearing the uh, orange bracelet? Then it doesn't matter what the other brother says because she's the only one or if he, you know, and it gets complicated. So you need to teach about DNRs and, and what are the rules and regulations behind DNR. And then what happens when he starts to get violent? Now what do you do, right? The brothers start to fight. What do you do? Call the cops? Get out? Right? So that's, you, you can build these things into your curriculum because there's a part that talks about DNR, you know, uh, well-being of the paramedic, uh, legal, legal ethical uh, considerations, stuff like that. And anytime you build a clinical scenario, you can also put a judgment in there, a values judgment. And part of, you, part of the way of doing that is also enlisting live actors. So you put, a, you put a person, one of the people, one of the partners plays the role of the guy who steals the medications. So he's a, com, uh, a confederate that the, the two partners don't know, right? And they're checking, you know, right, right person, right date, right stuff for me to take later and you build that into the scenario. Now what do you do, right? How does that guy handle that or that gal handle that situation? It's a matter of how you want to incorporate it. It still is a clinical situation that you have to handle, but those uh, components can be built into your education. And you know, all this stuff from the old national standard curriculum, that Appendix F is still good stuff that describes professional behaviors or behaviors that are representative of being a professional, I mean, one of them is like hygiene, right? What do you do when your partner stinks, hasn't had a shower for a week? And then you gotta think, well, why is that? Maybe he's homeless, right? He's living in his car. Now what do you do? So that's how you, you gotta think in terms of what do we want him to do, give him behavioral expectations, and then evaluate him and give him methods to address it, right? Does that make sense? So there's about 15 minutes left to five o'clock. I wanted to talk to you about something that's completely different. And a lot of people don't really know about this situation. And it's called wicked problems. These are problems that can't be solved. And I want to actually uh, challenge you the next time that you hear somebody say, you'll hear people say it all the time, the problem is right? Dot, 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 and they'll say something. Problem is gas prices are too high. Well, that's not really the problem. You got to peel the onion back. Problem is we don't have enough paramedics. Well, they'll say because they're not enough going to school, coming and signing up for paramedic school. But it may be because their high school education didn't get them a reading level high enough to be able to pass the entry exam or understand the textbook. So it, it's an education problem or you know, on and on and on. Uh, wicked problems are generally policy problems, things like uh, racism, poverty, things like that. EMS is a wicked problem. Um, and I'll, I'll suggest that there are five characteristics of wicked problems. And it's a consequence of complexity. EMS is not one thing, is it? It's the ambulance service, right? It's the paramedics, it's the nurses, it's the hospital, it's the insurance companies, it's the patient. We didn't even mention that till way down the line, right? Uh, it's the families of the patient, it's the community. All these things have various influences on the way that they describe the problem is. A 
person in the neighborhood may say the problem is you don't get here quick enough. But that's a consequence of other problems. We don't have enough ambulances. Or you call too many times and you don't really need us. Um, I'm banging through some stuff here uh, to get to the five characteristics. A guy named John Camillus in 2008 wrote an article called Strategy as a Wicked Problem and it was published in uh, Harvard Business Review. And when I read this article, it was talking about these characteristics of wicked problems. And when I read that, it's like, oh my God, that's us. That's EMS. So he said, increasingly complex environments make it difficult or impossible to develop models making traditional or standard planning techniques ineffective. So the way we do strategic planning currently, or the way we do CQI, presently may not work because of the complexity of the systems we are dealing with. And um, additionally, they don't generate new ideas. You don't get new ideas from doing chart review. What you have to do is do creative design and collaborative dialogue with the stakeholders. So the five characteristics, and we'll bang through these pretty quick. The problem involves many stakeholders with different values reflecting back on what we were just talking about, and different priorities, like you mentioned, right? So think about the people we deal with that are parts of EMS that look at the problem that we're dealing with, taking care of patients, getting them to the hospital and getting them the care they need from different perspectives. What's important to the hospital? What's important to the medic? What's important to the cardiologist? What's important to the nurse on the ICU floor? and they will define the problem is differently. And if we don't talk about these things together, we're never gonna get anywhere. We'll keep making mistakes. The issues roots this are, are complex and tangled. So think about, I don't know if any of you guys were uh, in Marty's talk, but he talked about uh, accidental death and disability in 1966 that sort of launched EMS. That's when they got to the uh, EMT curriculum was funded. Ever since then, EMS has gone like this. It's been divergent evolution. Every place has created their own EMS system. And they're intertwined. And there's not, you know, people talk about best practices. I would argue maybe there is no such thing as best practices that match up for every community. It's a best practice for your community. So we are faced with this tangled complexity of what EMS actually is. Um, the problem is difficult to come to grips with and it changes with every attempt to address it. So if you start to try and define the problem of EMS, you may find that what you thought was the case isn't the case anymore. Or if you make attempts to correct it, you've actually changed the system. That makes my head hurt. But if we don't recognize the wickedness and complexity we're gonna make mistakes and we're gonna possibly break or damage the system. The challenge has no precedent. So what we're doing in EMS doesn't really have deep historical precedents. I mean, you could go back to the Romans, you could go back to La Rey and Napoleon's army. You can talk about different aspects of where we came from. Uh, Frank Pantridge's article that led to paramedics in 1967. But we're, we're like charting uncharted ground. You know, this whole idea of community paramedicine, right? There's no precedent for that, really. Maybe, maybe visiting nursing in the, in the 50s was something like that. And then uh, there's nothing to indicate the right answer. You only have to, you have to try stuff and see if it works or not and be prepared for it not to and be agile. So these characteristics are part of what we're dealing with in EMS. So what do we do to fix it? You have to have conversations. Now you look at this conference here. Everybody here is an EMS person, right? So we're learning, we're learning what we're learning from one perspective, our own. Where are the payers telling us about how better to get paid? We talked, uh, talked about community paramedicine earlier. How do we get the insurance companies to pay us? Prove the need. Right? You need to get the politicians involved too, right? You need the community to say, we want it. 
We need data to support it. You know, Marty was talking about two years of data. There's a, lot of, a little bit more data out there in some systems. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, it's, the hospitals have to be at the table. The, the docs have to be at the table. The nurses, we ourselves. And we always, where, where's a patient advocate here in this conference? We all are patient advocates. We should be. <laughs> right, we should all be patient advocates every time. We should think about the patient's needs first. So if we want to do community paramedicine, how is it going to meet unneed, unmet needs in your community? If you're doing community paramedicine, that's where you start, uh, community gap analysis. So can, you, can, a, can your ambulance agency stand up a community paramedicine program by itself? I would argue no, because you've got to have support from the physicians, you've got to have support from the hospitals, you've got to have support from the community, you've got to have support from your agency. I don't want to drive around in that stupid sedan and go visit those old people. I came to be a paramedic to save lives, right? What we, I believe, as leaders, right, as people that are taking responsibility to move our profession forward or to move your own profession, your own professional development, your own career forward, you have to listen to all these other people and find a mentor have conversations. For organizations, you've got to bring all those stakeholders to the table to make the plan. Because you have what they, they call it dissolving the mess, untangling the knots. And it starts with collaborative dialogue where I get to start understanding what the OEM, the Office of Emergency Management, people are talking about. Because they talk about the same stuff we talk about. They got different names for it. Right, so for us, for us, this is a bottle. For them, it might be called a sniff. I don't know why, but that's what it's called in, in emergency management. If we don't understand that we're talking about the same thing, we're not going to have any kind of meaningful communication. Right? So our task from a macro level is, is getting these people together to, to have these conversations. So I would argue that uh, the charge is to start, start pulling your communities together and, and work towards what I would call we were uh, dispersing and divergent. We need to start working on convergence and coming to some ideas, some core principles, like around community paramedicine, how we can best serve the community. And that, that I mean, how often do you guys talk with your hospital or the hospitals that you go to? Or do they talk amongst themselves? I don't know the answer, right? So that's just a challenging th way of thinking. There's a, if you Google wicked problems, you'll find a lot of stuff uh, that can give you some headaches and some insight and in some ways to move forward, not only for yourself, but for your organization. So that, that's your value added moment for the extra 15 minutes. I had another piece that we don't have time for because we were listening to electrical uh, <laughs> electrical education. And you know, I learned really early on, if it's a wire and it's plugged in, don't frickin' touch it, right? So I wanna thank you guys. I'll be hanging around a little bit this afternoon if you guys have any questions or comments or uh, I have some business cards if you wanna reach out uh, to talk about some of these other things. I also wanted to pitch the, uh, my organization, National EMS Management Association, of which I'm president. We're working on, uh, by August, we should be releasing the first round of uh, EMS officer certification exams, whereby we'll have three tests uh, to certify a supervising EMS officer, a managing EMS officer, and an executive EMS officer. The supervisor will be a written test, the manager will be a written and an oral board, and the executive will be a written and oral board and a portfolio review. Um, it's going to be rolled out probably at Pinnacle. Uh, any of you guys that are interested in developing uh, your skills as an officer, uh, there's a thing called the Seven Pillars of EMS Competency at the nemsma.org website that you can download for free to get an idea of ways, of the things that you should have as competencies to, uh, to be an effective EMS officer. Uh, so that's my pitch for NEMSMA. 
Uh, certainly, it would be good if you wanted to join. Uh, we have about 900 members. We have about 65, I, close to 67 members on our LinkedIn group. And we have a uh, Google group, uh, a listserv that's got about 2,000, where you can reach out to folks all across the country and around the world. If you've got a problem and you post to our Google group, you'll have an answer probably in less than a day, sometimes in a matter of hours. Uh, a lot of real smart people that are on that group. And it's amazing the kind of information you can get. And that's a, that's a free, you don't even have to be a member. It's nemsma.org, uh, it's a Google group. Uh, so I'm done pitching. Thanks for uh, dealing with the craziness that we dealt with and coming out. Uh,